to another episode of The King Show, where kings consult with kings. We are here to help high-performing male leaders to continue to maximize their potential and master success in all areas of life, business, leadership included. And today, I'm super excited, super elated. I have another individual, another powerful guest speaker, another powerful guest that'll be on our show today. And he is he, he meets every requirement of being a high-performing leader, or what I like to call king just as everyone else has. And ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Mr. John Crossman. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, John, a little bit, if you, well, if you don't mind, I'd like for you to just go ahead and share a little bit about yourself. Yeah, and yeah so I always like to tell people, uh, beginning of my story is my dad was a pastor and civil rights leader. So I grew up in a pretty unique household, right? Um, I knew more about uh, Bethune Cookman and HBCUs before I knew about Florida, Florida State or UCF, right? So I had this interesting perspective, and I always tell people that, you know, preachers' kids tend to outperform lawyers' kids and doctors' kids in life. They've done research on that, and I think the reason is is when you're a pastor's kid, you know, you grow up in an educated household, you grow up in a household that's very uh, purpose driven, you have visionary, right? Um, but you also grow up in sort of a maybe a less economic means. You know, my, my dad was always like, tried to live by faith, and uh, I more wanted to have a little more cash <laughs> reserve. You know, I always tell people I became a devout capitalist at an early age, right. you know. But I think that that combination of things can really create some good things because as you go through life, you know, having a perspective of working hard and making money and then having the ability to serve with that is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, my dad's nickname was the Bridge Builder, and that goes back to, I can tell you a lot of civil rights movement kind of stories, but recognizing for his work to get communities to work together. And then uh, three years ago, uh, that then Governor Scott actually named an actual bridge uh, after my dad. So in, in Maitland, uh, the rail bridge there, you can Google it, the Reverend Kenneth C. Crossman Bridge is named after my dad, so the bridge for the bridge builder. Um, when I went to college, I ran track at, at Florida State University, and that was a great experience. Um, I didn't know this until my 40s, um, but I'm actually dyslexic. And so um, I, I always enjoyed school, and I wanted to do well in school, but academically it was always very hard for me. Um, so when I got into the real world, I wanted to be in a job where I could work a lot of hours, and I wanted to do sales because I could make money, and I got into real estate, and I've done real estate now, I think, almost, almost 30 years. Right. So I guess it worked out, but yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. And John was referred to me by way of my mentor, um, Patrick Morley, and... It, Tell me a little bit about how you two met, if you don't mind. Well, Pat, I go way back. I mean, partly is that uh, Pat was a real estate guy. Yep. And so I always enjoyed reading his books because he would make reference to real estate. In fact, I worked for the Trammell Crow Company, and in one of his books, he talks about when he met Mr. Trammell Crow. Mm. So we always just had like that, that connection together. And uh, for years, I would keep, you know, 20 copies of Man in the Mirror in my office wow. and in my car. I, I really use that as an evangelist tool a lot of the time. I give away to gifts as clients. And so he and I just, a lot of different journeys in life. And, you know, um, sometimes when you're in a position of uh, affluence or influence, you get people that come after you for money and power, things like that. And I joke because a lot of times people will say, well, you know, what we want is a relationship. You know, we want a relationship with you. And what that relationship really means is they want a check and they want you to shut up, right? Like that's what they really want. <laughs> Uh, Pat Morley is a relationship guy, Absolutely. and uh, one time I call, he called me and, and like he needed help in something, and I was in a really bad place, and he just threw the playbook out, and he just, he just ministered to me, wow. and, and that's how I, I feel so strongly about him. I feel like we, he and I have a relationship. I have a relationship with the ministry there. Uh, they're there for me. I'm there for them, and, and I've just been, a, been very passionate about the resources uh, they provided to so many people, so um, and I mean, he knew my dad. So again, that's like a 30 year relationship. A great guy. Yeah. Great wow. guy. It's something else that I liked about um, when I gave you the floor to speak about yourself. Something else that I liked about what you did just now is you actually made reference to you didn't call him this your father, but you made reference to a mentor. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's I think that that's that's a gesture that speaks something about your character for mm -hmm. one. And that's to be applauded. But um also, I think that it says something about the men that held a high um, value in your life, if you would, for lack of better words. And if you don't mind, you know, 
if there was a word that summed up who your dad was for you, what what would you say that that was? Brave. Mm. He was brave. People people today don't get it of some of the things that he did. And I and I give you an example. Old school Protestant churches. You got big pulpit, little pulpit. Mm -hmm. Big pulpit's the word of God. Little pulpit is the bake sales, right? Things okay. like that. And so regular people don't go behind the big pulpit. My mom back in the day, she would never go behind the big pulpit. That was a big deal. And so when you think about that in context, when big pulpit and a pastor's at that point, it's a position of power. Mm -hmm. It's a position of influence, direction. Pastors don't give up their pulpits. True. That's a thing. And you know, maybe they're sick, maybe they're out of town, but they don't give their pulpits when they're in town. My dad, starting in the late 60s, early 1970s, gave up his pulpit every year to Dr. Oswald Bronson, who was the longtime president of Bethune-Cookman mm. uh, University. And so that I, I grew up with that. Now, people might think, well, that's cool, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when he was doing it, he got death threats from it, wow. okay? Uh, there was another time that my dad was doing a revival in Georgia, and I was with my parents, and I was, I don't know, 10 or 12 in that kind of age range, and we were, had lunch at a diner, and the waitress told us that uh, the Klan was in town. They were meeting that night. Mm. And so we went to this revival, my dad's doing his thing, and he just trashed the clan. I mean, he just went off. And I can remember later that day being back in a hotel room and being like, man, dad, I don't think you should have done that. Mm -hmm. And my mom, I could see my mom's eyes, you know, she was thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, he was like, don't worry about it, pass the peas. I mean, he was not concerned <laughs> at all. Years later, I mean like 30 years later, my wife and I were traveling, going up to see some family up in Tennessee, and I was doing some research. My wife was driving. And I was like, man, I wonder where that was. I didn't know in Georgia where it was. So I called my oldest sister. I said, where was that? She goes, oh, yeah, you guys were in Stone Mountain. That was the home of the Klan. Wow. It wasn't like we were, you know, in Hawaii and he was doing that. It was like he was in 1982, you know, 83, at the, at the home base of the Klan denouncing them. So, you know, my dad taught me to be brave, not in a way of like, let's go in the woods and on a bear down kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He taught me to be brave um, in the sense of like taking risk and, you know, taking, uh, getting on the, on, the, on the right side of things. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, like, you know, I, 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 one time I heard a pastor preaching about generosity. And what struck me about that is I want to be generous with, with my pulpit. Mm -hmm. So my pulpit's social media, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I know I can put stuff out there. And I'm going to put a picture of you and I out there. I'm going to do it in the next 24 hours. I'm going to put it out everywhere. And there's some risk to that, right? Yeah, some people absolutely. may unfriend me or unlike me. Some people may, who knows? Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I feel a calling and I feel like I'm helping promote, you know, my brothers in Christ and, and things that they're doing, that's who I am, absolutely. right? That's who, I'm going to share that part. And so I think bravery, that's a big thing. Mm. Can I change subjects real quick because yeah, I was going to mention to you? Let's talk about mentorship. Okay. Because that's a really, I love, I love this topic. So... Let's put that word on the side for a second. Let's talk about a different word. Let's talk about the word uh, charity. Okay. okay. What is charity? Charity is, the, I would say, giving of self. Right. And we would expect what in return? Nothing. Nothing, right? So charity is giving, expecting nothing back. If you and I went and go worked at a soup kitchen feeding the homeless, we wouldn't get done and say, hey, where's our watch? Right, you know, right. we're, like, we're not going to get paid on that. That's ridiculous. So charity is one-sided. Mm -hmm. Charity tends to be in a crisis, right? Like, if a woman's getting beat by her husband and she grabs her kids, throws in the car, and she drives off, she's got no money, no clothes, like she's in a crisis. Or mm -hmm. people are her hurricane victims, like it's a crisis. It also tends to be something that's short term. It's a temporary thing, right? Like if you had a friend come to you in the middle of the night and they're in trouble, you'd help them. But if they came every single night, at some point you're like, wait a minute, this is not a crisis. No, that's what charity is. Well, then let's think about what's the word relationship. Relationship is giving and receiving. Mm -hmm. The art of a great conversation is, look at me, how are you? Mm -hmm. Like, you may have some friends that, like, they never ask you about yourself, mm -hmm. right? They're not good friends, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you know, I mean, we have to look at that. Are we, are we balancing that in relationship? So when somebody says they're seeking a mentor, what I always challenge them to think about is, are you seeking a mentor charity relationship? Or are you seeking a mentor relationship mm -hmm. relationship? So what's the difference? The difference is, to have uh, Pat Morley as your mentor, I would be like, man, that's awesome because you know he's giving you contacts, relationships, and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And I would say to you, make sure you're giving back equally. Absolutely. And you might say, well, how do I do that? Well, man, buy his book and give it a good review on Amazon, you know, or you know, be a fan of uh, Man the Mayor Ministries or ask him sometime, hey, Pat, do you need me to come earlier to Bible study and help set chairs up? 
whatever it is. I think that if we try to train young men, when you're looking at someone that you desire to mentor you, having a desire to have that be in relationship. When a student calls me and they're in crisis, of course I help them, right? But that crisis is always going to be temporary. Mm -hmm. When a young man needs my help and I help him and then he tries to pour back into me, man, you know what happens is over time we come, we become equals and sometimes, and this is the best thing, they pass me. Absolutely. I love that. I love that to see young men I've helped. Now I, I look up to them. That's, there's a beauty in that, right? Absolutely. So I just want to really push in, and it's like that. It's that relationship component, so key. No, I love that. I think something you don't know about me is that I started a private school called the Academy of Kings Preparatory School. Oh, cool! And the premise of it um, aligns. With, I believe that in order to grow a leader, there must be three things in place: a mentor, a peer, mentees. Yeah. And they all work together as right. one. There is no separate. There can't be any, you know, lopsided balance between the three. They all have to work and coincide with one another. In order for that person that truly scale growth in the form of leadership. And I love what you just said um, regarding Pat Moreland, regarding pouring back into him. In fact, something that I always say to him, I say, uh, I believe that a king is a servant leader. It's the That's epitome. Right. It's the That's epitome right. of a servant leader. It's not a, it's, the, it's not a guy that sits at the top of a mountain. In fact, the mountain is inverted and he's at the bottom of it. And he's, he's the one holding it up. That's, that's a true king. And so in that, uh, all I all I can do is come to serve. So I really love how you wrap that up, how you tie that in regarding the, the relationship between a mentee and a mentor and what they what it really should look like. It shouldn't be just one one sided in regard to resource. I'll tell you another quick story about that. I like to end meetings when I look at somebody. I always try to say, uh, "How can I help you?" Mm -hmm. that's, like I always want to like that's my rabbit. Like, how can I help you? You know. So I had an organization come to me, and they were working on um, promoting a bill to end modern slavery. Mm. And they had gotten with Senator Rubio's office, and that I'll take care of. And they want to get with Senator Nelson's office. Now, I work with both political parties and things I do. I'm personally a Republican, but I, again, I work with everybody. And so I've, I've got access to people. And so they asked me, could I get them access to Senator Nelson, who had done work with my dad? So I said, sure. And so we met with his top staff person in Orlando. We go to the meeting. And we work on it, present it, and they totally support us. And the end of the story is they got the bill passed. It was all good. So at the end of the meeting, um, I looked at his, Senator Nelson's uh, staff person. I said, uh, well, what can we do to help you? Mm. She was stunned. Uh. She looked and she goes, I have never been asked that. And I said, well, seriously, you're helping us. Like, what can we do for you? And she said, you know, I have no budget to do networking events. If you ever can let me be your plus one at some networking events, um, I would love that so I can get out and meet people. I said, well, you got it. I can't tell you how many events I had. I'm a Republican. I had this Democrat mm -hmm. woman you know, would come in as my friend, and then she would get to meet people. And we did that a bunch of times together. But it was like I wanted to show her the respect that she had helped you know, me in a request, right? Absolutely. And so sometimes it's just as little as that. It's just saying, hey, how can I help and, and listen? And you never know what's going to come up. Absolutely. How... How would you say, um, so we spoke about mentors in regard to right. your personal life. Mm -hmm. um, how has that translated over into business? Oh, in business, well, you know, what's funny is, is that I used to think when I was younger that you need to have like one mentor and uh, the kind of all everything. And what I've learned in life is, is that there's a lot of mentors, right? There's a lot of mentors. And a lot of times the men that have helped me the most um, are not business guys, mm. um, I'll tell you honestly, a lot of my blue collar, mm -hmm. working class guys, and a lot of them have been through recovery. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've had some sort of addiction issue, but they have so much wisdom to give. They have a lot of wisdom to give. And even in business situations, I still can pull from that, like the human component. On the business side, I've been very fortunate that I've had a lot of men that have you know, helped me along the way. When I've had young men tell me like, how can I find a mentor? What I always tell them is like, you create them. Mm -hmm. You create them. Absolutely. You know, like, if there are people you want to seek things from, just seek that relationship and make sure that that's an, that's an equal, you know, relationship. Like, and again, what you're working on. Um, and we live in a great community. We live in a great society that we have lots of Christian businessmen out there and that will help. And not only help, but like, they will give. Yes. They will give in ways people don't think that they would, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I always tell people, like, I live a boring life of no secrets. I put everything out there. It's like, it's like with the book, like, you can go to Amazon and buy that book. If somebody hears this and they're like, man, I want that book, I can't afford it, email me, I'll mail you a copy. Right. That's it, right? That's how I want to be. 
And there's a lot of great generous business people in our community like that. And by the way, there's a lot of great business community people in the that are not Christians. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're Jewish or they're atheists or different faith. And that doesn't mean you can't glean wisdom from that. Absolutely. And sometimes those people really help to make me a better believer. Mm-hmm. Side note, there's a guy I've done some business with. He grew up very strongly in faith. And then he had some really bad things happen to him. And he'll post on Facebook kind of really almost anti-Christian yeah. things. And people take the bait. And I always respond to his post, and I'll just say, man, I just want you to know how much I care about you. Mm. I want you to know how much. And he'll say some, like, weird scripture and always respond with, why don't we read the Sermon on the Mount together, you know? And then I check on him. I talked to him today. Wow. And he asked me about um, buying some ad space for a thing he's working on. And I said, man, I don't really need the ad space, but you're ramping up, and I want to help you. Mm. Like, I'm doing that. Wow. You know? And so it's helping me over a lifetime perspective to see through people's hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, I used to think in life that it was about trying to find my sins and then turning my sins and repenting of my sins, and, and that's still true. What I've learned is that deeper than is figuring out where I'm wounded mm-hmm. and seeking out where I need to be healed, because then that, that can sort of help to eliminate the sin. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And so when I can try to help provide some healing to men I'm around and then men that I know I need some healing around too. Mm-hmm. Is there any... Uh rubric other than listening to you speak it reminded me of the four of the four levels of value Mm -hmm. four levels of value at the lowest level of value is what's known as an implementer Mm -hmm. that's the person that most times actually the ones doing the work you have managers of the implementers which is the second level of value the third level is a communicator which is where you spend the vast majority of your um career and then you have at the highest level um, ideas, creators, individuals of the nature, or or money. Money is the is a very high level because money makes money. Right. <clears throat> you pointed out the actually the you you mentioned them as blue collars, the implementers. Right. And that was intriguing to me because they rarely get the recognition, if you would. However, in most cases, they know the craft better than everyone. Right. And, but, but in most cases, we would go to the influencers, which would be your communicators or your idea right. creators for, right. for mentorship. So that's what made me ask you the question about a rubric. What is your, what is your, what is it? I don't know, maybe you never even crystallized it, but how do you know when you got a guy? <laughs> Let me, let me say that for me, okay. and then I'll let you re- I'll respond to it. So I used to, I want you to visualize. Uh, let's just say you, because you, you're a smart leader guy. You know, if you say to me, you said, John, here are 10 things I think every leader in Orlando, men, whoever you're t- influencing, they need to score a 10 on all 10 of these, and you root them out, whatever those factors were. I think that if I took that test on one category, I would score like a 78. Like, you'd look and be like, Crossman, man, you... You're off the chart. And then the next thing, I'd score like a two, okay? Old school me would look at that and say, man, I should take that first thing and blow it to 150, right? New school me is like, you know what? That could actually probably come down to a 30, and I'm still above average, but I need to try to get that two to a four. Mm -hmm. And honestly, what I've learned in my life, this is my perspective, a lot of guys who don't figure that out and they try to take that 75, blah, 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 they end up dead. They end up dead. They end up, end up in a really bad place um, because we need to be balanced. We need, we need to look at Christ's life and understand there's certain things that, you know, are maybe easy for us or natural for us and some of the things that are really, really hard, right? So I'll give you an example. Um, when Jesus was notified that one of his good friends died, Jesus did what? It's a short scripture. He wept. He wept. Why? Right. But, you know, in a way we would say, well, why is he weeping? Why isn't he saying this is a celebration? He's in heaven. You know, like you know, that doesn't match in, in a lot of our Christianese world we kind of speak in sometimes. I think that he wept because he's the great teacher. Right. He was teaching us what to do. That that's that's what we that's a natural thing when we when we have lost to weep. And so I tell you that um, I think like a lot of men and you, you're a football player, you get this. Um, 
when I was 12, I took feelings and I just buried them deep down inside. You know, I didn't cry for, you know, 30 years. I had to learn how to cry. I had to learn how to have that experience. And, you know, sometimes when you're in a place of power, you know, you have people that want things from you, then that's just reality. But a lot of times they won't tell you the truth, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, from my era, you know, Michael Jackson and Prince, why aren't they around? Great, some of the greatest performers of all time. Why are they not around? Well, they died. Well, they were super rich guys. They had people they were paying around. They had people around that weren't really taking care of them. Right. Now, shame on them because they probably weren't seeking the truth and like allowing that in, right? But, but that's what can happen to that. So, but if we choose to be in a relationship with people who uh, there's nothing to gain from them, right? So like my buddies who like blue collar working class guys, they don't want nothing from me, just friendship, right? And so if they get me mad and I get mad at them, we can, we can work that out. It's not going to bust up some business relationship. On the other side is this. I have got to be able to talk about my life in, in reality, mm-hmm. right? So if you said, John, tell me about your week, I'd be like, well, you know, I had lunch with the dean of the family college of law and I'm working on all these civil rights issues. I got a former congressperson. I'm trying to get pardoned by President Trump. I got that project working on. I got this new business. I'm writing another book. Like, these are all things that are going on in my life. This, these, are, these are my reality. Somebody might say, well, that sounds braggadocious. I'm like, I, I don't know to tell you. Like, this, this is my reality. But I have other realities to me. I, I have um, my mom and my wife both have a lot of health issues. We talked about that. I have a lot of parts of my life I'm lonely. I'm lonely. Yep. Now, when I tell you that, it helps me. Like, I feel better just to put it on the table. Well, what if I don't tell you that? What if I don't have men in my life that I can call up and say, man, I'm just lonely. I just, I don't want to talk to you, right? And I keep that inside. Well, that's how men end up having an affair or having, you know, like some really bad thing happen to them. So learning that skill set. People used to tell me, you should be more transparent, tell the truth. And I'd say, I think I am. I didn't even know how to get the truth out of me. And so I had to open myself up to learning some different lessons that different people God put in my life and could do. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And so, like, one of the things I did is I went through a study called um, uh, Voice of the Heart, and really great Christian Bible study, and in it, there was, a, there was a chapter on something, like, sad. It's like, in the workbook, it was like, write the 10 saddest things that have ever happened to you. Would you believe this? I looked at that and said, I can't name any. And I went and saw a Christian counselor, and I said, man, I don't think I understand what sad is. And I learned that I think that for a big chunk of my career, my addiction was success. Because instead of dealing with a failure in my life and sadness, I would just go try to do more business, do more deals. And some people in the faith will say, well, that's God's hand on He's having you prosper. Maybe, 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 or maybe I wasn't listening to him, right? And so when I went back and retrenched and learned and you're like, well, we read the Psalms. Man, David's putting it all out there, right? You know, we, we can, I used to say these words all the time. If you said to me, John, how you doing? I said, good. You say, John, how you doing? Blessed. You know, now I will say things like, dude, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Or, you know, I'm really sad. Or I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confused. Or, you know, whatever. But it took me working through those skill sets. And I, I'm one last thing on that. Like, um, I tend to think that there's some things for me that are super easy that for many other men are really hard. But there's some things for me that are really hard that for other men are, are, are easy. And I'll give an example. I don't know how to grill. I don't own a grill. I don't know how to grill. If you said to me, hey, John, I want to come to your house, watch a football game. Let's grill, grill some steaks and watch a football game. I, you know, my brain will want to pull out some paperwork and do some paperwork <laughs> like, and, and, and stuff. I don't. And so I confess that to you that I've had to learn. I'm still learning how to like just hang out with some guys and just relax. Because I, you know, my dad, when you, when you were the child of somebody like my dad or somebody, a politician, you know, passed like that, there's a sacrifice to the family. You know, I saw my dad do great things, but I didn't see him relax much. Mm-hmm. And we know that we need to relax. <laughs> so we need to have a day of rest, you know, all those different influences. Absolutely. Now, you, you put out a lot of... Sorry, let me no, 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 ramble. No, no, no rambling. You put out a lot of great points. And just to recap, what I received from it is that ultimately it's an art. There's no science. Yeah. You know? There's an art form. And another thing that um, really that I really gleaned from what you said, which I believe is is my superpower, and that's self-awareness. Hmm. 
you come into a state of understanding self and being aware of your strengths. You, you spoke about, you know, on a scale, if you measure that 78 and two, that's self, it's self-awareness, is understanding where point A is and having some idea of how to get to point B in a joyous state. And that's what I say to my young men uh, in, in the school. Um, hey, listen, my objective isn't to judge you no matter where you are. It's to understand where you are and, and, and have an objective and a goal in place and get to that objective in a joyous state. And that's ultimately what we're talking about, you know, Christianity, but that's what I believe Jesus, I, actually he said it, it's not a belief. He said, I came to give more life, that more abundant. Right. And that's what success is for us. Success is getting what you want, right? That's all success is, is getting what you want. And then getting what you want, what you really want is freedom or more life. And that is what I'm hearing, you, how you worked through that, how you processed getting more life true success, if you would, not an artificial success in the form of business transaction, is by way of studying other people and then studying yourself. <laughs> True. Well, it, it's, listen, it's painful. Oh, I mean, yes. you, you, but again, that's when I talk about how I, I, I like, look, I like having friends that are al alcoholics, like, you know, recovering and recovering addicts in other places because they have things to give. They've been there. Mm. And they're not fooled by stuff. They'll call you out, right? They, they have that wisdom. I'll tell you one uh, just quick, interesting story. When I sold my company, you know, for the, I grew up with scarcity, man. Like, mm -hmm. we, I, we didn't have stuff, right? And so when I sold my company, first time, I've got, I got money in the bank, and I don't have to work. I always tell people I found the end of Netflix. Like, I'm, <laughs> you know, like, kinda, uh, so I, I met with a friend of mine, and he retired from a Fortune 500 company. And we sat down, we had lunch, and I was like, you know, what do you think? And he said, John, you need to hire a consultant that can help you through this transition. So I hired the same guy he did. Very expensive, tons of time. They do all this research. And, and during that time, I met with some other CEOs of some other big-name companies and getting their advice. And at the end of it, they created this book, and they have all these things that tell you who you are, mm. right? So one of the things that came out of that was they have a, a box, quadrants, and how you match and different things. And I did not land in the bullseye for a CEO. Mm. And when the guy, when they were telling me this, I could tell they were nervous. Like mm. they were gonna, they were thought I was gonna get mad. Honestly, I felt relieved. Mm. I really did. I was like, oh, like I just take that off me. I don't, I don't need that title anymore. I don't have to have that. And then they did this points thing of what occupations you match the best. I kid you not. Under florist, they gave me a twenty-one. <laughs> right. So I was like, that's bad. For architect, they gave me a negative 27. Wow. I was like, you could just give me a zero, right? You don't need to like <laughs> point it out that bad. So they had the top three occupations they said I matched with. Number three, politician. Mm. Number two, uh, real estate sales, which I'm doing. Number one, pastor. Influencer. And I said, um, that's who I'm going to be. I'm going to be those three things. And, you know, and what I mean by that, I'm not going to have a church. I'm not that guy. And I'm not going to run for office. But when there's political issues that I have passion about, when there's ways I can, I can be here with you and support you in what you're doing, I can do those things. And I'm still going to do some business deals too. But part of all that is, is um, I don't have this need to feel like the man anymore, mm -hmm. right? Like I got asked if I wanted to be chairman of this one board and, I, and I, the guy called me and I said, man, I said so much of my life I wanted this call. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want this. But there's a, there's a young African-American woman that's on this board, and she's she's an attorney, and she's super successful. She's actually the one that needs to get this, not me. Mm -hmm. And so I've been promoting her up into that position. And you know what's funny? I have so much joy in that. Mm -hmm. I have had so much joy moving behind the scenes and watching other people step into stuff. I would never thought that. I would never thought that that was a joyful thing, mm -hmm. but it really, really is. Yeah. And and so to get in that place of feeling centered and peaceful. And knowing that everything's temporary anyway, mm -hmm. and we're going to lose everything every mm -hmm. anyway. When I sold my business and I cleared out my office and I brought all the stuff home, I had more stuff than you can think of. I threw a lot of stuff in the way, and I had some things I saved, you know, for my kids. But I started just giving stuff away, mm -hmm. like taking things that were really important to me, and just praying about it and uh, and just giving it to people. And I had so much joy doing that. And guys who I've seen retire after me, I've encouraged them to do it. And a lot of times they don't. They cling to their stuff. Mm -hmm. 
And what they don't know is that when they pass, it's going to go in the garbage. It's just going to go in the garbage, man. And so uh, some of that stuff, again, it was hard. Some of it to give away. But again, it, the, the humility, the, the beauty of the humility of saying, man, I, I'm not going to st- shove all this in my coffin. You know, it's, it's going to go, you know. So if I can give that to somebody now, it blesses them. Absolutely. And so in my mind, like, I want to give away all my lessons. I want to give everything away. I want to give it, all of it, the, the money, the everything. It, like, like as, mu- as much as I can just push off in different times and hopefully be led by the Spirit to do that, that's a fun journey, man. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Leave empty. That's what I. <laughs> yeah. That's what I say every day. You know, when um, when I when I get home, I want to feel completely depleted. Right. You know, I left empty. I left the day empty. I love that. Talk about a lot. Any questions? So, uh, John, other than your father, who else had a big influence in your life? I um, uh, when I was in high school. And remember, I said I was dyslexic, and I, but I didn't know it. And so school was hard for me. And uh, when I was a junior, I took a speech class. And uh, I did good at it. I mean, it kind of was like a light. You know, it's like something turned on. It's you know, like something you just, man, I feel kind of called to this. And one day I was walking down the hallway, and uh, the speech teacher, who was the debate teacher, he looked at me. He said, you should take debate next year in your senior year of high school. And I said, um, uh, man, I, I, my, my schedule is all set. I can't do that. So about a week later, I, I saw him again, and I thought he said the same thing. John, you need to be in on the debate team. And I said again, I can't. My schedule set. He goes, no, 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 that's not what I'm telling you. He goes, I went to the guidance office. I changed your schedule. You're on the debate team. Now, I didn't even know, could he do that? Was that even legal, right? And so I joined, was on the debate team, and uh, changed my life, absolutely changed my life. And so, um, so, you know, I wrote this book. I mean, just so you know, I hired a ghostwriter. And wh- how I wrote the book was I would speak it, and then I would record it and send it to him, and he would, he's a lawyer. He made it sound, you know, good. Well, I dedicated the book to him. And so over the years, I've stayed in touch with him. And he, um, uh, when I got into the FSU uh, Hall of Fame for the college business, he came up for it. Last year, I got an award from Palm Beach Atlanta University for stuff, and he, he came to that. And so about two months ago, uh, his name's Dr. Kozel. He was riding a motorcycle and got an accident. He passed away. And yesterday, that, yes, last night I was on the phone with his widow. And um, she asked me, she said, I want to create a scholarship as a memory. Can you help me? And I was like, absolutely I can. And, and the reason why I wanted to share all that with you is like, it, you know, when somebody sees something in yourself, like that's an amazing thing. Like that's amazing. The other side of it is like, Man, I always wanted him to know what he meant to me. I didn't ever want it to, like, and I lost him way younger. I mean, I, yeah, I'm still grieving about it. I would have thought I'd have him another 20 years. But I, I, you know we're going to do a scholarship because I want to do so much to recognize that. Uh, but that was, a, that was a great, great moment. Um, and you don't get a lot of those in life. You don't, you don't get a whole lot of that opportunity when people just believe that you can do something and you don't, and you don't know yourself. I refer to those people as, in many cases, confidants. Mm-hmm. And the most part, one of the most powerful people I ever heard speak about this degree of friendship uh, was T.D. Jakes. Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, and what he said, he broke it down in, in the three P's. I'm sorry, the three C's. And you have um, a, a contingent. And a contingent is pretty much a business relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a boss employee if you would employer employee and it the relationship is contingent upon you doing your task if, when you don't do your tasks or we we're not um uh, you're not pursuing the goal that i desire for you to pursue then the relationship is probably pretty much going to come to an end then you have a comrade and in a comrade in a comrade's relationship i'm not necessarily for you uh you're not for me but we're against the same enemy and as long as you're against that enemy, then you're my comrade. The moment that you no longer decide to fight that battle or whatever the case, there goes the end of that relationship. And then you have what's called uh, a confidant, which is what I heard you just speak of right mm-hmm. now. And that confidant is for you. They're, whatever it is that you're, they're just for you. And you hit it on the head. You don't, and that was just wisdom speaking. That was experience. Right. 
you don't get a lot of those. T.D. Jakes actually said a blessed man gets two in a lifetime. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I was like, man. You know what's funny? If, if, you, if you don't know the story, look it up. It's the story of Mark Eaton. Mark Eaton was a mechanic, okay? Guy comes in to get his car worked on, and he looks at Mark Eaton. Mark Eaton is seven foot four. Mm. And so this guy's like, what are you doing being a mechanic? You should play basketball. Pushed him. He played for a small college, got out of the college, played in the NBA, played in forever, and you can see him. You remember the famous basketball player Dave Robinson? Mm -hmm. uh, Dave Robinson said in every, he goes, man, Mark Eaton's big. You know, Dave Robinson was seven foot two. And so... That was an example of somebody you just look at Mark Eaton, you're like, what are you doing working on cars, you know? Well, you know, I think all of us are 7'4 in a way, yeah. but it's not as obvious. And so when somebody sees that in you, the other side of that, though, and it's a lot of like what you're talking about is that when that happens, you got to be open to receive it. Mm -hmm. you got to be open to receive it in the sense of believing it. When someone says you can, like to really like take the risk, mm -hmm. but then you also got to be able to receive, you know, the criticism, you know? And I always say to people like, you want to have relationships in life where people tell you the truth. And that sounds great, except when somebody tells you, like, man, you got food in your teeth or your zipper's down, that's not going to feel good. And then when they say something like, man, you got an anger problem. You know, you, you, you're not treating that woman right. I mean, like, when it hits, like, all of a sudden somebody says something that hits you in, into your identity and, you're, and it feels like a punch, you've got to train yourself to be like, wait a minute, thank you. And then slow down like why is that and look there's bad people that will say critical things they're not helping you but when you work into the relationships and you're trying like man this person they love me they really care they're trying to say something helpful and then really trying to break that down that's that's a very hard skill that most people don't figure out i i told you my superpower is self-awareness i i make it known in my business in my home in my relationships with anyone Call no yes men allowed. Call me out <laughs> when you see me moving. And and then I don't just say do it. I give I actually give room for it. I send out this text message maybe like once a quarter. And I send it to 15 of my inner circle. And then it it says, one of the things it says is name the thing that you trust me. I'm the first person that comes to your mind. Name the thing that you would never trust me with. Name the thing that, or name the person or the individual or the position that you see me in, in my supremacy. And that, probably like every quarter on the year I do that. I even created my own 360 degree high performance appraisal. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, all of my products that I've created came from my need <laughs> to grow self. Right. And that is what I believe lead, ultimately leads. I've never, I've had a lot of success in my life already, but the thing that paid the most dividend is what we're talking about right now. Well, you know what's interesting is, you know, not all Christian men agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. Like there are Christian men who say, I, mean, I don't know if they'd articulate this way, but it's certainly it seen what they practice is, God put me in control, I'm the leader, that's good. they're my followers, they do, I mean, that's how they think. That's and and, and I, I look at that, I'm like, well, that that works assuming that you're always in touch with God and you and you don't have any sin and any woundings, but we all do, right? And so, you know, we have to have a quarterback and we have to have somebody, but, but you know, when you're in the huddle, like to me, it's like in business when you're, I love working in collaboration and, and when this, the staff is telling you the truth, you know, if, you, if you're in the quarterback, you're like, man, we're gonna run play and the whole offensive line is like, don't do that. You know, you would think you'd go, wait a minute, you know, like you have to be able to receive that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I tend to, when I, when I hear some Christian business talk like that, it, it scares me. I, I have some fear that that may be coming out of their own pride and sin and not from, you know, really wisdom. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Uh, or hurt or fear, whatever, whatever that is. Absolutely. You know? You, you just breached into another um, aspect of what I teach, which is the fact that if it's true that mothers consult with mothers, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm a father, <laughs> I'm a husband, I never have yet, I've yet to hold a decent conversation with my wife about children, about motherhood. Yeah. Right? I can't. I can't go there. CEOs consult with CEOs. Kings consult with kings. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what it's saying is that you need two things in your life to thrive. You need an accountability, 
need accountability. We all do because we're humans bound to disrupt things. And you need a community, like-minded individuals. That's right. And that's where, for that individual that would say, hey, I don't agree, I beg to differ. Even if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit doesn't stop you from doing anything. He doesn't say, wait, no, don't do that. He, you have free will to some degree to do as you please. So, yeah, to that guy, I, I can't. I can't allow him to continue in that train of thought and think that it's going to generate. In fact, I would challenge him. Email me, <laughs> Mark, M-A-R-Q, at A-O-K-H-P dot com. <laughs> Email me if you beg to differ. I would really love to hear how you, you know, what, what, what's, your, what's your comeback to that? What's your, what's your rebuttal to that train of thought? That's you know, I think that... Um uh, the politically Republican, conservative, all those things. But my commitment's to the truth. My commitment's to Christ. And I, um, I did an interview uh, last Monday night mm -hmm. on the Black News Channel. Okay. And they were asking me about the Republican Party and what they were doing uh, and, and to appeal to the black vote and things like that. And I hammered the Republican Party. I mean, I hammered because on that specific night, I mean, there's other things, but I, I did not agree with it. And it was funny because, you know, some people got mad at me about that. And I'm like, guys, look, you know, there's a higher calling than a political party. My friend said it like this. He goes, my dream is that the Republicans and Democrats will put up candidates so Christ-like that we as believers are struggling which one to pick. And I'm like, that's true. Like, like yeah. that's true. And so, you know, even when we have somebody like we really run a vote for alike, man, if they're doing something that's counter, we have to have the bravery to call that out. We don't just blindly, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And frankly, when we do that, we help those leaders. We're not helping people by just telling them they're great all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, again, uh, I don't think any man really learns in isolation. Right. Right? That, that can be a very dangerous place to put people. Absolutely. Were there other questions? Or anything? Absolutely. Any other questions? What other books would you suggest? Uh, so what other books would I suggest? Um, the book of Proverbs, you know, I always tell men, you know, men, you know, you're trying to figure out where to start the Bible, you know, you read one chapter a day, 31 days, and you've, and you've read the book. I love the book of James. I know you probably met other books, but I'm just going to share these. And then it was funny, I really love the book of Genesis. And I'll tell you just for me personally, I really identify with Old Testament Joseph. I really do. That cat was a dreamer. I'm a dreamer. Mm -hmm. He had big visions. I had big visions. His siblings want to dump him in a well. I think they still do, right? You know, so like, and I get it. Like, and, and when I look at him, I always think, man, Joseph probably could have had more discernment of who he shared his visions with. Mm -hmm. And I like, as I get older, I'm like, yeah, you know, not everything God can put a heart and mind me to share with everybody. What is that? Mm -hmm. um, I think beyond that, you know, I really try to be thoughtful about what I'm reading in, in different cycles of my life, right? From a business perspective, I really enjoy Malcolm Gladwell's books. Yeah, I just feel like they have a lot of wisdom. I got to meet him one time. He was a runner too. He's running, mm. but really, really good guy. And it, and it just kind of connects with me. Like when you think about the book Outliers, where he talks about the rule of the ten thousand hours, and you know that people want to do something. Like man, if you see a great drummer, you see a great waitress, you see a great you know whatever. Like man, they, they put a lot of time into it, right? Like that. It's not like they just walked up and did that. And so I like that, that as far as the skill. I'm a big Malcolm Gladwell fan. And then, um, of course, I love Pat Morley. Yeah. <laughs> I like Pat because like, I think his stuff is very real. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is my wife really loves his books too. Mm. You know, um, uh, When I talk to college students about real estate, I have four authors that I recommend to them. And typically what happens is if they email me, I'll email them the name of the four authors and I'll copy them mm -hmm. on the email. Mm -hmm. And you know, the really good students will like you know reach out to them, um, but I, when a students push into me like, well, you know, what else has influenced you? Like, man, there's nothing changed my life like Sermon on the Mount. Mm. You know, I still read the Sermon on the Mount. You know, what I always think at the end of the you know, does you know what I think? I can't do that. That's what I think at the mm. end. Like, to me, the end of the Sermon on the Mount is like complete submission that we can't do this. Like, we we Christ can do it. We can't do it. 
it's such a mind blowing, you know, thing to sort of retool and rethink about our lives. Mm-hmm. You know, because man, if you lose yourself in the world's thought process, man's thought process, you're going to be depressed. Oh yeah, that's where that's going to go. You're not going to you're not going to go cycling through all that and and end up and be like, ah oh, man, you know. Um, you, Mr. Siegel, you know, and here at one of our Central Florida residents, and has his largest home and you know, so wealthy. He spoke at a conference and all these young people really wanted to talk to him because of money and all this stuff. And I had met him maybe once before, but I bumped into him, I want to say two years ago at a very small political event. And his daughter had just recently passed. Mm. And so he was promoting on, on the stuff about opioids. And I went up to him and I said, you know, I don't really know, we don't really know each other. But I said, Mr. Siegel, I said, I'm so sorry for the loss of your daughter. And thank you for what you're doing. Mm. Brother, his eyes, mm. His eyes. Do you think, you know, what would he give to have that child back? Right. Right? And so um, money has its place. There's no doubt about that. I of all people get that. At the same time, there are so many bigger things. And making sure we stay balanced is so key. Of course. Um, I think the, a book that I'm reading right now that has been transformative in my thought is called Psycho Cybernetic. Hmm. by, um, last name is Maltz, first name is Mark, I believe, Mark Maltz, Psycho-Cybernetic, check it out when you get a chance, um, very insightful regarding um, self-image, that's, that's what it's overall talking about, it's talking about self-image, it's talking about the fact that ultimately your identity dictates your per your per your personality and your behaviors so get a chance you know it's funny about that so yeah you know, i ran track in college mm-hmm. and i was a sprinter and people would say to me man you, you're probably part black most people say that to me <laughs> and i would sometimes get mad about that i'm like man I, you know i'm working hard man. But we had always, as a family, had this theory about my grandfather, my mom's dad, that he was of mixed race. We talked about it. So I did Ancestry.com. I am part black. Like, mm-hmm. we proved out, like, he was mixed. And, you know, uh, it's funny because I've really enjoyed telling that story. But I want to say it in context. And I always tell my daughters, like, you can't claim another race unless they claim you. <laughs> and also, you can't claim another race unless you've experienced what that race has experienced. And so, like, mm-hmm. I'm the whitest guy looking guy possible. Mm. But I have other relatives that are very, that you absolutely would identify as black. So I got um, in an argument um, with a guy recently and he got mad at me and we were disagreeing with him and he said, man, you're a racist. Mm-mm. And I said, well, you know, it's funny. I said, I'm not. I said, but you also don't know my racial makeup and you don't know who, who I am. And the older I get, the more I dive into that, I. I really identify with a black part of me. Mm. I really, you know, like when I, I see that, I, 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 like to, I like to pull into that, right? Mm. And I know that like people throw me in different boxes. I like not fitting in those boxes. Mm. You know, it, it's like I, I said to some people one time, well, when I saw my company, I really enjoyed introducing myself. People say, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm employed. Mm. But I like that, just the humility of like, you don't have to go through your life having a title. Right? Absolutely. And so I want to be respectful when I talk about things like that. I don't want to do anything that's offensive or hurt to people. But I also think that when you talk about knowing yourself, like the center of that is that we're brothers in Christ. The center is that we're loved by God. And then how we then connect with people in different ways, you know? Mm-hmm. And man, more than anything else, so many times it's like we're dealing with people, treating people with respect, and people treat with people with love. Absolutely. I love it when I post something on Facebook or someplace that's a little bit controversial. Somebody goes off on me. I love this. Mm. And I respond back and I say, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I can't tell how many times I've gotten people to calm down. You remember Marco Rubio Mm -hmm. posted about um, Congressman Lewis passing and then tweeted and he put a picture of Congressman Cummings. Mm -hmm. People were hating on Marco Rubio. So I put this picture up of me and Marco Rubio. And I said, I support Marco Rubio. People started coming at me, hate. So you know what I did? I put up a picture of me and Congressman Cummings, mm-hmm. and then a picture of me and Congressman Lewis. <laughs> and they do look a little alike, by the way. You know, great men. So somebody said to me, I can't understand. How could you possibly love Rubio and Lewis and Cummings? 
And I said, well, you know, I do. And, 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 and he said something negative. And I said, listen, tell me somebody you love. Yeah. So you know what he said? He said, Hillary Clinton. I said, let me tell you something about Hillary Clinton. When my dad died, she wrote a note to me. And I have it framed, and I have it in my office. She wrote a note to my mother. I framed that and put it in my office. Now, how, did, how could he respond to that? Right. I, you know, I, I, did, I would, did not vote for her. I would not vote for her. She's not, but, but, but I respect her because of her kindness to me. I met Michelle Obama, who absolutely may be the most impressive person I've ever met. And I put a picture of she and I together, and some people really freaked out. Some people really mean. I'm like, guys, listen, I don't have to agree with somebody politically, but we can agree on kindness. Absolutely. Character. Right. Absolutely. Can I tell you a story about Bill Clinton real quick? So my, Bill Clinton sent my dad a really nice note. I read my mom noticed when my dad died. And I did not like Bill Clinton. I just confessed. Like, I had anger in my heart against Bill Clinton. I don't like this guy. I didn't vote for him. I don't like him. But I had the opportunity to meet him. And I thought, you know what? Out of respect for my father and what he did, I should thank Bill Clinton. So I'm standing there waiting to meet him. Secret Service comes up twice. And they said, don't give him anything. I said, OK. So he came up, and I showed him. I said, you know, President Clinton, uh, this is a picture of this note you sent to my dad. And like, on behalf of my family, I just want to say thank you for this. And he looks at me, and he goes, can I have this? I was like, yeah, I man, I will. You know, so he took the picture I, I had just because I was showing him. And he went, and then he came back out on stage and did speech, and then he left. And so I'm hanging out. This woman comes up to me, and she says, sir, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, sure. She pulls me back and says, she's like, you need to know this doesn't happen. But President Clinton wrote order to you know. Mm. And that guy, he wrote on there, John, thanks for all you and your dad have done. I'm like, I like Bill Clinton. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, and so people can say critical things to him. I'm like, but you know what? Like, I appreciate that humanity. He did not have to be that kind to me, right? I mean, he did not have to do that. And so I always come back and like, people will say, well, we need to love others and love people that are different. And a lot of times I like to say, what if they're wearing a MAGA hat? What if they're wearing a hip jab? What if they're wearing, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you know, people say that, but a lot of times they, they only mean certain people. Mm -hmm. Man, the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. Good point. They did not. They hated each other, right? And so when we think about people that are different, sometimes people are easy to love and sometimes they're very, very hard. Mm -hmm. But, you know, God, we're called by Christ to love people that don't like us. Yeah. What a great calling, right? Absolutely. Sorry. Any fine. Any, any other questions? Yeah, I was, found it interesting how you talked about um, enjoying having friends that were recovering addicts and things. So I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I work in the uh, recovery ministry here at the church. I'm just wondering where that kind of came about. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for your, your work you're doing. And, man, that's awesome. I, um, I was very much aware of that all that kind of stuff. My my uncle, who's one of the best, men, my uncle was the most Christ-like man I ever knew. I mean, he was a guy that was a recovering alcoholic for 30 years, never missed a meeting, and it was not uncommon for him to lie in a homeless shelter next to another guy to help him out and try to get them into some rehab a facility, things like that. So, I had a very positive experience. I mean, picture of it, but I didn't put myself in that context. It was only when I went through my own road to recovery and. You know, real quick, you know, I've always been like a hard charging guy and, you know, I was a sprinter in college, but when you get old, you can't sprint. So, you know, I got into running distance and I was doing all this work and then I was running and I ran a half marathon and it was my best time, best time I'll, I've ever run, I ever will run. But when I crossed the finish line, I didn't feel right. Like I saw an ambulance and I was like, maybe I should go get that ambulance, you know. And so the next day I went to work and the next day I had one meeting, my calendar was open, I went to the doctor's office and I said, um, yeah, these are my symptoms. And the nurse said, she goes, you're, you're, you're suffering from depression. Mm. And I got diagnosed with clinical depression. And I'm telling you, man, brothers, I'm telling you, I have had stitches. I've had, I mean, every kind of pain, like the pain scale, like I've, I've had all that kind of stuff. Clinical depression is the worst hell on earth I've ever experienced. And I'm grateful for it. That, that is weird to say, right? I was, I had to lie at the feet of Christ. There was nothing. I mean, you strip me. If you would have brought in like, you know, $10 billion in cash, I'd have been like, I don't care. Like if you brought my favorite foods, there's nothing you could have done to put in front of me in the bottom of that pit. Nothing. Mm -hmm. All I could do was cry and weep. And, 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 and my wife helped. I mean, my wife helped got me through it. 
And so when I went through that season, I, that's, I, I took Zoloff and Klonopin for a year. You know, I saw a psychologist, saw a psychiatrist. I mean, that was, I think it gut punched me to humility to learn like what rock bottom was. And then out of that season, I met two guys. Uh, we were at a Christian camp together and hearing them talk about their story of going through recovery. And so um, I, did a, I did Al-Anon for a while, um, which was really helpful. Um, but what I did was is I had a Friday morning Bible study, and I basically I changed it into a recovery group. And, you know, for the moment, it's like learning a different language. Like once you learn recovery language, it's kind of like you, you learn Cantonese, and you only speak Cantonese. And, like, so I, I, I speak that language all the time. Now, I've not completed, like, a 12-step program like, like you have, which I'm not – that's so much more respect, you know, for that than for me. I will say that I've tried to make my life into that world. I – I think my addiction was success. I think that my addiction, my heroin, was that, that high of trying to get something done. And I do think that at some level I have to fight away from that. And the, and the key thing is like feeling my feelings and speaking my truth. But you know, look, man, I'll say it to you like this. We can tell young Christian men, like, here's what you need to do. You need to go to college. You need to graduate. You need to get a job. You need to marry a nice young lady. You need to you vote and tithe and do the Bible study. And I did all that, all that. And I mean, success, I mean, if you look at my resume, it's ridiculous, the success. I was miserable. What the hell is that all about? I mean, what, what happened, right? And so I had to really come to grips with that. And then when you're doing that well, even in our, I mean, sadly, even in our Christian community, we can have a like, man, you're blessed. You're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed, blessed. But you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you're like, I don't feel blessed. I feel terrible and I hate my life, right? We, we put too much pressure on pastors, I think, a lot of the time, right? Your pastor has so many great skills they can handle. They don't clean teeth. You don't go to your pastor for a cavity, right? You don't go to your pastor for a heart transplant. It's spiritual, right? But you're like, right? And so when I went through that season, it just opened my mind up to all these things. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I'd rather hang out with you. I'd rather hang out with you. Because if I tell you something to go on in my life, there's a well you can pull things out of. I was just talking today about, um, that was the expression, uh, the hallway. Like, you know, when you hit rock bottom and, you know, there's good things coming. But when you're going through that transition, it's, it's bad. It is really bad. It's really hard. I can't remember the context. I was talking to somebody about that. But, but helping people, I know what it was. For me, if you want to hire me as a consultant, either for you as like a CEO or for a company, I'm the best guy for you if you really want to change. And if you don't, I'm the worst. Because I, I'm, not good, I'm not good with stagnant. It's, it's why I'm not really a good CEO, right? Like, like if, if you handed me some big corporation that was had record profits, I don't know what to do with that, right? Like I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that you bring in when the company's messed up and I fix it up and then I hand it to a real leader like yourself and then, and then, you, then you got it. And so I, I really some drawn to that. I like hard conversations and I just, I don't know. In my, day, in my life now, I'd rather hang out with a bunch of AA guys than anybody else. I just would. They've got more. Work is easy for me. Like, I think work's easy. I think success is easy. I think money's easy. Mm -hmm. Freaking living life is hard right. for me. And those guys have stuff to give. Yeah, I think that that's who we're speaking to in the high-performing male leader, you know. And it's, it's what we call the three Ps, priest, protector, and provider, you know. When you look at a Jerry Farwell Jr., I look at that, this is me, mm -hmm. and I'm like, does not surprise me. Not, not for one second. When I think about when, when he endorsed Trump and Trump said two Corinthians, I was like, what is going on here? That, that, that seemed very weird to me, weird to me. And so when I've seen all that go down, I don't, I'm not celebrating it. I'm not, I'm not shaming it. I'm just saying it didn't surprise me. The reason why it doesn't surprise me is like that happens so often. Like Christian leaders get in bubbles and then we let them be in bubbles. And they, we don't even give them paths out of it. We don't even get... Like, where was the path for them to get out of it? Like, when we think about the number of pastors we've lost to suicide, suicide. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. 
you want to experience a Christ-like moment in the next 12 months, let me tell you what you do. Come with me to the suicide walk in Baldwin Park in February of 2021. And if you, you get a booth at that, let me tell you something. There's 2,000 people at that event. How you know many churches had booths at it? Zero. How you many Christian ministries had booths at it? Zero. It doesn't mean there weren't Christians there. But that's ugly. Thinking about suicide is ugly, right? It's like thinking about kids getting molested or something like that. But how do you get free from that? You get free from that by telling the truth and talking. When I was at that suicide walk this year, I saw this young woman, little kids, and people wear beads, and the beads similar who's they lost. And I said, who are you walking for? She said, my husband. It's little kids. And I said, how are you doing? Are you, are you getting your recovery? Are you getting help? Yeah. And she was very monotone. And I looked at her. I said, um, one last thing. I said, may I have a hug? And I came around, and she hugged me. I mean, like, belly to belly, like you wouldn't believe, right? Talk about life. Life, like giving is receiving life, you know? And, and we as a church fail so many times in that kind of stuff because we, we, it's just hard for us, I think, to, to go there like, and, and sit and sit in sadness and sit in that wounds. But that's where, we, that's where joy comes out of. And that's where my heart breaks where I'm like, man, we need, we need to be in those places more often mm-hmm. and just sit with some people sometimes and weep with them. Mm-hmm. And greatness will come out of that. Okay. That makes sense. Well, it's what the word says, the word says that it's better to be with those in sorrow than those in celebration. Mm-hmm. And it's for that same reason um, that you mentioned right now. It makes it easy for me to ask about your wife. I just lost my grandfather, so it makes I'm it sorry. really easy to ask about your wife, you know, and, 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 and press into that situation a little bit. But I don't mind that, and I understand the growth that comes from me sitting in that moment with you. Yeah. So. I'll tell you one last story. I'll get out of your hair, but I, want you to, I just want to tell this to you. A guy who's a competitor of mine last Sunday morning calls me on my cell phone, and I didn't answer it because, like, why has somebody called me Sunday morning? <laughs> like, when have I been available on a Sunday morning my whole life, right? So I didn't answer it, and he's a competitor of mine, and we don't know each other that well. And I listened to the message, and his message was that one of his employees, who I had a little bit of a relationship with, had been missing for five days. And so I texted him. I said, hey, man, like, I'm going to do some research. I'll help you out. So I, I started stalking the kid on social media. He had really no footprint. And then I started reaching out to some people I knew that might know him. And I reached out to his dad in kind of a stealthy way to not, because you don't want to freak somebody out. So finally, afternoon comes, and I tell this guy, and again, we, I'm not, I've never had a meal with this guy. I'm not close with this guy, but I said, listen, man, I said, everything you tell me if they research, I said, you need to go on this kid's house, go to his apartment, you need to bring the cops with you and bust in. This is last Sunday. And he says, I can't, John. He goes, uh, I lost somebody's suicide. I found their body. I, I, can't, I can't do it. I said, well, I'll go. I called my buddy. He came with me. Always good to have your buddy with you, right? And I rolled down there. We're driving down there. And, and uh, I was like, man, we're going to come out of there with a body one way or not. So we, we come rolling into the reception area. And this is young lady there. And I walked right up. I said, listen, let me tell you something. This young man has been missing five days. You're going to get me in that apartment. Or I'm going to get in that apartment with the cops. Well, we're getting that apartment right now, right? And I didn't mean to really freak her out. But in my mind, I'm like, this is well. So long story short, we get up there and get in there and pound the door. And he, he answers the door. And he'd been drinking and smoking weed and that stuff. So I came in there, and I lit him up. I mean, you never see me lit somebody up. And I looked at him. I said, let me tell you something, son. I've been thinking the last 15 minutes, so who was going to be the right person to call your dad and tell him you're dead? That's what I've been thinking about, right? And after lighting him up for a while, I hugged him, and I held him real close, and I like, got right in his ear, and I said, you need to know how many people love you, how important you are, you know? And I called his dad, and we got all wrapped up. But part of the reason I want you to tell that story, there's a lot of, re- a lot of real things like that. If you want to be a man that's a leader, you can't be getting high. Yeah. Right? You can't be getting drunk. Because what would happen if I, if I was drunk? I can't go over there and help, right? You, you can't be a leader if you're a fool. Like, why did that guy call me? Mm-hmm. You know why he called me. Because he, he, he knew I, could, I would jump on that grenade. Because that's who I want to be, right? you got to have confidence. you gotta, you got to be walking to a situation and assess the situation, right? 
I knew we were dealing with life and death and how, and how we're going to roll with that. And so I think there's a lot of men want to be that guy. It's like a lot of men want to be the quarterback on the football team. Man, you don't, you don't just walk up and throw in the jersey, do you, right? There's like all those steps. And I think it's the same thing in life. Like, I don't want to be a guy that people think, man, I want to go to this trip club. Let's call Crossman. Don't call me. I don't want that call. But, you know, if you've got a friend of yours that's in prison, you got somebody in the hospital, you got somebody that's homeless, you got somebody that's missing, call me. I want that call. That's who I want to be, mm-hmm. right? And it was hard. I didn't want to spend my Sunday that way, that, that way right? But, I'm, but I'm, I'm grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You, you're bouncing around the concept that we speak about a lot um, in our association, High Performing Male Leaders Association. And that's the three Ps, priest, protector, and provider. And these three things are what every man, whether he will, will admit it or not, is constantly trying to find equilibrium around. You know, how do I improve myself to be a better provider or businessman or extract wealth from the economy and a leader, an individual that can actually grow people, you know? And no matter where you're at, whether you're in business or whether you're in life, everything about any person you respect or the respect that's due to you is going to be based on your ability to grow people, lead people, which is why I'm so passionate about leadership. And it goes back to your point. Ultimately, how do we position ourselves to make better leaders, specifically better leaders in men? Like this young man you were just speaking about, that's that comes from a lack of identity. Naturally, if I know who I am, almost instantly, I know what I should be doing. I definitely know what I should not be doing. And I think that that's the message that is so often um, hidden. We don't speak about it. You drive down a road, and I say this in my book, The Four Stages of Manhood, you're riding down a road, it's not often that a man that you'll see any sign tell you who you are. You'll never see a sign point to identity, what you should be doing. They'll tell you what to do with your resources, your time. They will never tell you who you are. And I think that that's what makes what you're sharing right now, and that's what makes this show so powerful because it's a message that men don't have. No one's able to speak it. No one's able to... I mean, even if they do feel it, they can't speak it. They can't talk about it. They can't talk on it. So I appreciate you sharing that. I have, I have one other question for okay. you. Okay, one and last then, one. I gotta get going. And then we can get going. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned, you talked about being in a quiet place, about being lonely. Yeah. That's the word you use. Yeah. And this is a place that a lot of high-performing male leaders find themselves. Mm-hmm. It's natural. Yeah. What are the thoughts that go through your mind during those times? <laughs> um, uh, when you feel thirsty, what's God telling you to do? Right. Right. If you feel hungry, what's God telling you to do? Eat. Eat, right? When you're feeling lonely, you know what God's telling me to do? Eat. No, can you? Like, like I, when, I, when you say that, it's like, you know, there's some natural unhealthy things that I, that I want to that I want to go to. What I have learned to go to is that when I'm feeling lonely, loneliness is God's gift to me to remind me he made me to be in a relationship. And so when I'm feeling lonely, the key is to call somebody, right? And it's not like one guy. It's I got like five guys, like, like a depth chart of guys because I don't want to overwhelm any one of them, right? And they're five healthy guys, right? Like some people say, well, you know, I have some guy friends, some girlfriends. I'm just telling you, no. Like, and then some of your guy friends are bad guys. It's like, you know, you got it. You know, that's, that's going to go back to the recovery thing. Like guys who have been through it, like that's to me. And I'm not telling you, like, look, being alone and being lonely are two separate things, right? There's a time when I'm alone and I love it because 
I'm, I'm being active, or I'm receiving, or I'm praying, I'm journaling, or, or I'm, I'm resting, like there's that. I'm saying lonely is something different. That's where it's like I'm, I'm feeling something significant. Could, could, be, could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, but I'm feeling like I'm going through that path solo, mm-hmm. you know? And so um, to, to, for me to mature through that, it's learning how to call men and share that experience and have that in- healthy intimacy to say, this is what I'm going through. That's good. Right? That's good. And so, and I mean, and I've, I've had, <laughs> I've had both, man. I've had, I've had, I've had super big failure and super big disappointment and super big pain. You know, if you want me to tell you sad stories, I can fill up <laughs> a lot of sad stories. And then I've had just joyful, awesome, huge things happen to me that I can say, man, tell me to tell you this great thing. But learning that when I went over in those highs and lows to, to monitor myself, uh, to make sure I'm speaking that out and talking that through, that that's just been really key. I know, man, if I start getting super lonely and I don't do that, I will end up in a bad place. Mm. Because, you know, when you get really down and you, and you lose your identity and you start thinking things like, well, it doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. You know, nobody cares. Like, you, you can really find yourself and then making some super bad decisions. And look, man, no matter how bad the decision, you know, we can be redeemed. But, man, the consequences can be, you know, very, very severe. Very severe. And when we think about things like people in high positions that fall, you know, man, if they, if they had gotten to deal with that, they, they would have fallen lower and it, they would have been covered faster. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I talk to college students, we talk about Anthony Bourdain or um, um, uh, Aaron Hernandez, or we talk about Matt Lauer, right? Like, how does this happen? How do people make millions of dollars? Like, mm-hmm. how do these things happen? Well, it wasn't one step that got right. them there. It was dozens and dozens and dozens of steps that got them into, like, just a really, really bad place. And an ending that that's, that's not how we wanted to, to go down, mm-hmm. you know? Absolutely. One of my things in life that I feel blessed by is I, I've lost uh, six friends who were older uh, through hospice. And so I've, I've, I've spent significant times with people on their deathbeds. And, man, I've been around some really cool guys who really had nothing in the end. And every one of them, when I saw them, I'd be like, you know, man, is there anything I can do for anything you want? And I was always like, man, what if they ask for my car? You know, just, mm-hmm. like, just teasing. Mm-hmm. They never do, man. They just want some time with you, and um, for the most part, those were really at almost all of them. They were peaceful, and um, I've I've admired that so much of how those men have, have have passed on from this earth. And I think I never thought I was going to live this long. I always thought I was going to have a short life, mm-hmm. and so that was probably part of my intensity. So I'm grateful for the life I've had, and I'm grateful for every day, and I want to keep giving. And I now, when I look at older men who I want to continue to aspire to be. And they're they're peaceful, you know. I got um my my uh, nephew and his wife are expecting their first child, and when I think about that child, I think, man, I just want to hold that baby. Mm-hmm. I just want to play with that kid, you know. Because when you're younger and you have your own kids, like your life's kind of crazy. But I, but I, as I get older, I want to be an attentive grandfather. I want to be an attentive uncle. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, one of the seasons of life for me is learning how to be present. And I'm a guy, for the longest time, I'd be like looking at you and then looking at my phone, and and I'm really trying to be active and present in the moment and enjoy it, Mm -hmm. you know, like enjoying this time and then, and and just enjoying the relationships and what God gives us. That's good. John, thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to The King Show. I'm Mark Neesman. It was a pleasure having you. I hope that you enjoyed yourself as much as I did. John Crossman was an amazing guest speaker. Next time, maybe I can actually have you live in the audience. So feel free to reach out. Go to our website, kingsshow.live. That's K-I-N-G-S-S-H-O-W dot live. Book out your, uh, book, get a ticket, and you can come in here and see us live. We're here in Orlando, Florida. So if you're in the surrounding area, we'd love to have you in. If not, no worries. Feel free to subscribe to any pod, to our podcast on any platform that you utilize right now. Again, I'm Mark Neesman. It was a pleasure. Fix your crown. Have a good day.